Review program, which airs every Sunday evening from 5 to 6. I encourage you to check it out if you haven't. Uh, but all of the programming on WRT, from uh, folk to jazz to classical to uh, news and public affairs to literature to science, uh, it's stuff that you're not going to hear anywhere else, and that's why we do it. So, thank you. Questions? Mm -hmm. Yes? I've got a couple of questions that I, I don't want to monopolize this gathering. Uh, you know, those uh, reporters uh, from Al Jazeera and Egypt, uh, you know, when they're reporting the news, from their story, I thought, I thought they were innocent. But after hearing your paragraph, <laughs> after that you read, I would say guilty as charged. <laughs> because it's, you know, is, is, is there, was, was it their responsibility to report news or to incite? And, and uh, if they're really rebel reporters, I think they were inciting. Well, and, I, okay, okay, that's, 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 that's a, I'll say that's a comment. All right. Okay, you know, I'll, I'll address that too, but go ahead. <laughs> and, and, and my question is, um, you know, I, I know what WPRs, I, I listen to WPR, I know that what their philosophy is, they have to present both views because they're, they're funded by the government and they're not allowed to uh, be biased in one direction. Fox News is sort of biased in one direction. I'm just wondering what the bias of WORT is. And uh, what have you said about Black Lives Matter, for instance, something kind of controversial? Yeah, yeah. Well, so a couple of different things perhaps all entwined together. I think that um, what one will find, whether it be in uh, uh, the Middle East and the Arab Spring uh, of the last couple of years, or whether it be reporting in um, uh, Mexico, as John Ross did for 35 years of his life, is that very often when you go and give voice to the people at the bottom, the people who who are being affected by the policies of governments and corporations, that you're often seen as an enemy of the state and treated accordingly. And I think that that is um, uh, what happened to those Al Jazeera journalists that were jailed for so long in, in Egypt. Um, I think that it's uh, what's happened to many journalists who have been killed doing their jobs around the world. In terms of the, um, the political philosophy of, of WRT, I'll, I'll address it in two ways. Um, we also, by the way, get some money from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting at WRT. Uh, and we are also uh, scrutinized for um, objectivity by the um, uh, standards of the CPP. But here in the United States, in general, community radio has followed a different path than it has in many other parts of the world. In many parts of the world, community radio is more partisan and more advocacy oriented, sort of like the old style newspapers that, that uh, Bob was talking about. Here in the United States, for the most part, um, community radio has, has followed that the path of trying to present the story and then letting the listeners be the ones to decide. In fact, our, um, our sort of slogan at WRT is, uh, uh, WRT doesn't have opinions our listeners do. And so we try to give voice to those opinions and to help create an informed and educated electorate who will then make decisions and influence the policymakers to move issues forward. So we try to present issues, but as John points out in the book, we don't go to the, um, to the gates of the concentration camp and interview the commandant because that story is getting plenty of airplay on Fox News. Mm -hmm. um, we go to the people that are affected by those policies and we tell their stories so that you, the listener, can receive that information and make a more informed decision about your opinion about that issue. Disciplined or 
pulled onto the carpet for, um, I think John Ross's term, listening too well to those mm -hmm. who do not have power. Yeah. I just wonder if you have any reflections about how do we serve people like that into this conversation about rebel reporting and, and institutionally ratified or hegemonic. I, I want to jump in first and then I'll toss it to Bob too. But um, I mean, particularly in the case of Ray Bonner. And of course, uh, the anniversary of El Mazote was uh, two days ago, I think December 11th, if I remember right. And um, uh, similarly, um, December 10th was the anniversary of the death of a journalist named Gary Webb. And it's really a classic story of somebody who pushed the boundaries of investigative reporting and went to get the story outside of what the mainstream was accepting and the mainstream turned against him and basically destroyed his career and Gary Webb ended up taking his own life uh, in uh, 2004. Um, Tell them what the story is about. Gary Webb was the, was the journalist for the San Jose Mercury News who first um, popularized the story of the Contra cocaine connection and the flood of drugs into uh, South Central Los Angeles as a result of US policy in Central America in the 1980s. He wasn't the first reporter to report on it. Bob Perry reported on it a decade or more earlier, but it was Gary Webb's stories partly because of the internet presence of the San Jose Mercury News. It was Gary Webb's story that really popularized that to an audience and actually did have some uh, political impact. Maxine Waters, a uh, uh, well-known congresswoman from that region, speaking out on it in, in Congress and so on. Um, but I think that we often see those cases of reporters who have stepped outside and are disciplined by their own fellows in the profession. Um, there was uh, the couple in um, uh, Florida who uh, were uh, reporters for, was it ABC? Um, who were uh, uh, pushed out. There's the story of some of the people that worked on some of the tobacco stuff and so on. So there are many of these stories. The case of Seymour Hersh is, is interesting because he is, partly because he's so prominent and so well known and so successful, is able to hold an oppositional voice within uh, mainstream media. And um, I think that uh, you know, there are certainly there are certainly a number of examples of the, of that as well, but it's much much more difficult. I don't know, Bob, if you want to. Well, there's so much to say. It's a great question. Uh, <laughs> I, I, it's a couple things I'd say. Uh, the English journalist Robert Fisk, who covers the Middle East, has a great story um, where he says that when he's in hotel bars in the Middle East, talking with other journalists, he'll talk with American journalists, and they'll have great stories. They have wonderful analysis. And then a couple days later, I'll pick up their article they wrote, and he sees none of that in there. It's all washed out completely. And he's going, is this the same person I just had got drunk with two nights ago who was telling me all these great stories about how things actually work in this country? And he said it happened repeatedly, and it just became clear to him that the professional process sort of, uh, what's that joke about bureaucracy converts energy into solid waste? Sort of that professional process does that to good journalism and these sort of things. It has to get to its ideological blender at the end. And I think that still is the case. That was what Bonner met. I mean, he, he was allowed to be a smart guy. He just wasn't allowed to put it in his story. He had to keep it in the hotel bar. Um, as for Seymour Hersh, he's had a great career, but I mean, I think he's the exception that proves the rule. I mean, our, even at its best, our economy's been able to support about as many independent journalists like Seymour Hersh as we've been able to support, um, you know, sculptors. I mean, it's like being an artist. I mean, it's, a, it's not something you can aspire to and hope to support yourself for a decent living as a rule. Uh, and I think that the other point, though, that I, I alluded to this in my talk, and then we shouldn't leave this without talking about it. Free, professional journalism, we know, is in free fall collapse right now. If you go to any city in America today, there are probably 35% as many paid working reporters as there were 25 years ago at this time. I mean, newsrooms are cemeteries. There just aren't many people covering anything. If you go to the state capitol here today, Anyone who knows what we had in the late 80s when I came here, well, how many reporters were there covering the Capitol? Yeah, it was a full room, I know. Yeah, it was a full room. What is there now? What is there now? I don't know. I don't think anybody even uses the desk. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> basically, <laughs> most of public life is not covered by someone who's accountable for what they do, and they're certainly not competing with other people. So if they miss the story, someone gets it. So 
even the sort of traditional critique of how bad the journalism is and the professionalism misses the story that this whole system is disintegrating for our eyes. And so what we're left with is a lot of people trying to be like Seymour Hersh, uh, to support themselves, because there's no conventional jobs, there's no day jobs at all out there, very few. And I get endless emails from young people who want to be journalists who are desperately trying to eat. I mean, they're just trying to survive. They're not trying to get rich. They're not trying to be an MSNBC and be celebrities. They just want to be able to eat and uh, without having to like sell insurance or do something else. And uh, the, what the great pressure on right now on, on real journalism, people trying to support themselves, is to monetize what they do. So it's really corrupting the journalism. So if you go to a website, they're so desperate to make money, you've got to write a story about whatever who's going to pay the bills wants to have. We're right back to where we were 100 years ago before professional journalism. It's a very severe crisis. I'll just leave you on that cheerful note. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a question. As I was, I think you know, I'm very concerned about what's happening in Colombia, which is an area where journalists are very numerous and everything else. I'm wondering about what kinds of institutions exist to protect people who are in countries like Colombia where there's a lot of violence and they're, they're trying to report honestly on what's going on there and their lives can be threatened. Norm, you feel yeah, well, the most, the most prominent group uh, is uh, the Committee to Protect Journalists, um, and I cite them in the appendix here. They uh, do some very fine work. I've worked with them on a couple projects, getting some people out of jail over the years. And um, uh, they are an international organization with regional offices. Um, there's a couple of other ones, Reporters Without Borders uh, uh, does some work. And actually, um, uh, Frank Smythe, a, a friend of mine in D.C., wrote um, a guide for journalist security um, that uh, included some sections on Columbia that uh, Chip Mitchell, a uh, former Madisonian who was living at the time in Bogota, worked on. Um, but it's a growing crisis. The number of journalists, and, and we cite this in several places in the footnotes of the book, the number of journalists killed is on the rise everywhere, particularly right now in Latin America. Uh, Iraq was the most dangerous place to be a journalist, but now it's moved um, to Latin America, particularly Colombia, Honduras, but also Brazil um, and uh, Mexico. Uh, mostly because of the drug war. Basically right now, and there was a, a very good article on this, just I think it was New York Times last weekend, but the, basically the journalists in Mexico are not able to cover, to report on the drug cartels at all, um, and so they have to, uh, if they do, they have to leave the country basically for their own safety and the safety of their families. So this is a great, this is a great tragedy in the world today. The world, um, has become a place where information is power and the people in power want to make sure that their voice, not the other voice, is the one that gets out. Can I just add something? In Colombia and Guatemala, it's not just journalists, it's anybody. It could be a bus driver or whatever profession you have. People uh, want you to pay a little bribe to them, organize gangs and stuff like that. You're in for it. So I, I don't think it's like a special situation for journalists. It's a special situation for everybody. Well, I think That's there's two. I, I think there's two parallel tracks going on because absolutely the the violence and particularly the gang violence in in Central America is uh, is increased dramatically recently. Um, but I think the separate track is that journalists are specifically being targeted for the work that they're doing. Um, in fact, there's a new book out just now um, by uh, two. Uh, former UW-Milwaukee professors um, about the uh, killing of journalist uh, Manuel Buendia in Mexico in 1984. And that book just came out from UW Press uh, uh, last month as well. So. Bill. Um, well, it's good to, when you speak of journalism, when you say it's collapsing, it's going to evolve somehow, somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's, I'd like to have some perspective on uh, what's the role of media such as exist, i.e. Twitter, mm -hmm. Facebook, you name it, you know, social media, is there any role? I mean, my exposure to them is I see them as very, very disorganized, very, very unstructured, and I see so much information at times, people I interact with, and I think quite often are just overwhelmed by all of the noise that comes from these other sources that has no information. <coughs> like it's going nowhere, it's just a puff of smoke that's going to the air and nothing happens. 
Well, you know, you've actually sort of answered your question in a way, that, or defined the problem better, <laughs> because uh, just having access to social media does many wonderful things, especially for working journalists, for collecting and sharing data for citizens, but it doesn't solve the problem. Uh, in fact, it in some ways makes it worse. It's a blizzard that makes people just turn off all their senses at a certain point. And I think the uh, Edward Snowden and WikiLeaks revelations are both really good examples of the role of journalism versus just the role of releasing information. Uh, for WikiLeaks revelations or Snowden's to really add up, it required people who knew something to go in and spend a lot of time ferreting through it to figure out what was actually there. You couldn't just sort of look, grab a sentence out of context, say this is what's in this report. And that's a journalist. And not you, you and I can't do that. Maybe in an area we're experts, but as a rule we don't have the time to do it ourselves. And that's the role of journalists. Their job is to do the hard investigation, bring the skills to make sense of that noise. And that's the institutional basis we're losing. We have amateurs wanting to do it. There's nothing wrong with amateurs. Uh, but they're better if amateurs basically are soloists on top of a rhythm section provided by trained working journalists, rather than just soloists without a rhythm section, to use a jazz analogy. Because uh, you, know, you need someone who's accountable to cover stuff, who's competing to do it. And if they don't do it, they have their head rolls. Journalists, you volunteers. If we just rely on people in their free time to do our journalism, it's just not going to work. We'll have lots of stories about basketball, where to get a good hamburger, mm -hmm. or crazy <laughs> stories, it's stuff you want to write about for free. If I'm going to write about, I'll write about basketball. I'm not going to get paid. Uh, but you aren't going to let people do the hard work to sit through that long tedious report to get to the bottom of something, which is what we need. Now, I think it's a very solvable problem. This gets us off the track. I mean, I think this is a. You know, the debate I referred to with James Madison and the Foreign Post Office is precisely the debate they were having at the beginning of this country. How do we make sure we have an independent press that can be a fourth estate? that will have the resources to do the job we need for this governing system to work. That's, they understood that. That's exactly what the debate was about. That's exactly the debate we have to have now. The commercial system's dead. Advertising no longer is going to support journalism. How are we going to have people get paid in competing independent newsrooms to cover their communities so people can govern their own lives? It's a very solvable problem. Right now, it's the political system is standing in the way, and the fact is that there are people in our society who benefit by a lack of journalism who oppose any efforts to create it. Um, so Bob and I are both uh, graying and long in the tooth here, so I want to yeah. see if I can get Crystal in to come <laughs> and, and talk on this point too. But I do want to just say one thing, which is, you know, for all the, the talk about, oh, the internet is going to replace newspapers, what people have missed in that conversation is that almost the starting point for almost all of the stories on the internet, whether it be, you know, retweets of articles or whether it be people's blog posts or whatever, is regular everyday journalists working usually at daily newspapers. And that is the pool of material that's shrinking radically right now. And, you know, here in Madison we lost the Capital Times uh, a few years ago from being a daily print paper to being just an online publication. Uh, in most cities around the country, we've seen the newspaper market constrict radically over the last uh, decade. The, to me, the ray of hope is actually comes out of the indie media movement and Seattle in 1999. And the idea of using the tools of the internet, the tools of um, corporate globalization, which is what the internet has become, but using those tools as a method of distributing information. And so in indie media, the idea was to get citizen journalists to learn the skills of journalism and then go out and put out stories with photos, print, video, and audio distributed through the internet to a worldwide audience. And the result of that was on November 30th, 1999 in Seattle, the indie media website had more hits than CNN. Because CNN was reporting from the press release from the mayor's office that said the police are not using rubber bullets in Seattle. The indie media reporters were going into the streets of Seattle, gathering up handfuls of rubber bullets, videotaping them, and putting them out on the internet. So I think there is a lot of possibility in journalism today, and citizen journalism is a big piece of it. Obviously, people need to get paid and be able to survive, and that's a much longer conversation. But the idea of involving all of these different voices and the distribution of production and the democratization of production of media through the internet is what allows this. 
we can go out with Free Speech Radio News and have people in places all over the globe right now contributing stories to a radio news program that's produced in a couple of different cities and then distributed through the internet and rebroadcast on community radio stations. We can do that because these technologies and these affordable tools exist now. But you still need the guidance, you still need the, um, the techniques of journalism so that you know that that material is vetted and presented in a way that it's informative and not misleading. And so that's where um, a book like this and the work of making, honing your skills as a journalist, making yourself a responsible journalist, comes in. I want to add that not only a responsible journalist, but a responsible citizen. And that's sort of how I've always approached. I can only speak to my own personal experience. When I met John Ross, like he said, eat all the God of the Sitch, let's go to the place where it happens. And I did. And I never went there thinking like, oh, I'm going to publish this story and make money. It was like, one, I want to learn because like I grew up on Fox News and Rush Limbaugh. And like, remember writing a paper at 18 years old where I said, you know, like I think I quoted Bill O'Reilly as like a valid source. <laughs> And now I'm a teacher and I just had, you know, my first round of my first term teaching and I had somebody quote Donald Trump um, as a valid source to say how we need to strengthen our borders. And so like I'm not that far removed from that. I know where that's coming from. And I wouldn't say that like I started out this conservative person, but it was the only exposure I had. And so when I met John Ross, I was like, oh man, I've got a lot to learn. And so like I went and I just like continued to absorb this information and when I saw something that I could contribute to, mostly WORT, I did it out of like my own sense of obligation. I never did it trying to look for a, a paycheck and that's um, because I, you know, I've, I've known about this from like Bob McChesney of like this is, this, is just, this is just failing, like I, you know, there's no chance of me really to be able to do that and so it was never that for me. It was just this moral obligation um, and to the public and to myself of like building, John Ross always talked about building context. And instead of just like swooping in, telling this like exciting story and being wrapped up in everything, you go to a place and you meet everybody and you get involved and invest in the com community and that's when this passion evolves and like you all of a sudden start caring what's happening to your neighbor. The first story that I think that John Ross ever published was like an environmentalist story and it was just like a, almost like by happen chance he's like I have to write this because this is, there's something wrong with this. The next thing happened is like his house is being shot up and he's like well, I guess I should get out of town and, like, <laughs> and, and go back to the US which he was arrested and served time for being the first person to avoid the draft um, and served a year in prison so he was kind of you know. <laughs> but yeah he always approached it as like or the way I interpreted my encounter with him and with working on this book is it is really about being a good citizen, and part of that is education and building context for yourself, um, and then also going, moving forward and doing that for others. So now I feel like, you know, I didn't start out, Norm has had a wonderful privilege of growing up in an activist family, and I didn't start out that way. So I'm able to relate to my students and talk and start this dialogue, and now that, you know, that they're 18, like, which is where I was at that point, and, um, and see if I can get them within the next few years to where I am at now, hopefully. Like, that's where I see my role as um, moving forward. So I, I feel like this is so much more than just reporting. It's really being a good citizen. Um, what would John Ross say about the, the comedians that they said? I'm not, I'm not a journalist, I'm a comedian. Mm -hmm. So very incisive, and that a lot of young people get their news from, from Yeah, from John Stewart or, uh, uh, Bob, do you have something on that? Well, you know, they play a large role, you're right. Uh, actually, the most interesting story about the, the use of comedy now is these sort of substitute journalism came from, of all people, Ralph Nader. Uh, he came here uh, when he was running for president in 2000, and he did an event, and you might have been there, it was the Orpheum, and he had a meeting for supporters across the street in what's now the Overture Center. Uh, and I, he was, someone asked him that exact question. And he said, and only, this is something only Ralph Nader could do. He said that when he finished I think law school in 1959 at Harvard, he'd heard all how horrible the Soviet Union was, so he decided on his own to go hitchhiking in the Soviet Union in 1959. So he spent like six months traveling around the Soviet Union to get the lay of the land. And he said when he was there, he was struck by how dead the official culture of the country was, Pravda, Tass, Izvestia, how mindless it was and how vibrant the underground humor and culture was. That once you got away from that and talked to people in their living rooms and they had comedy and wit, uh, he said it was amazing. And he said that's sort of what he felt when he saw uh, the great communities. He was referring then to Michael Moore, who was on the stage with him at that time. 
because someone asked because that was sort of the first example, incarnation of this. And he said, you know, our, this comedy is so important because the official voices are so bad. You know, they, our, our journalism, they, they fill a void that the, a journalism in a healthy society ought to be doing, just like in the Soviet Union. So while we should commend them, and thank God they're there, they're comic geniuses, um, <laughs> they're no substitute for having actually a <laughs> decent journalism, a decent media system. I think John, in, in the book, in the lectures, and also um, in his own career, showed this, uh, this weaving, this interlacing of John Ross the poet and John Ross the journalist, that there are many, many times when you can paint a picture or tell a story with a poem or a comedy skit or a song or whatever that you can't, uh, that you can't do in an article, and so for him, I think that the culture was integral to the kind of communication that goes on in rebel reporting. Or cartoons. Yeah, yeah or cartoon, political cartoons. Of course, there's a grand, grand tradition of that going back hundreds of years. Yeah, there, there's one reporter who, who dares to say the unthinkable. At, you know, at really very interesting, Dallas Darling. I'm just wondering how he survives. Uh, because he can't, obviously he's not a member of an institution. He wouldn't hire him. But ever so once in a while, whenever there's a big issue, all of a sudden an article comes out by Dallas Darling. I was just wondering what was your, what was your impression of him? And also, uh, obviously you you're idealize the, the rebel reporter. Do you guys consider yourselves to be rebels also? I do personally, because this man really inspired me. It was these lectures that made me who I am that transitioned me from um, Fox News to WORT and realizing that like I, I didn't have an interest. Like This is me, though, like, and that's not saying that I ever had an interest in really being a professional journalist. It was that I wanted to be an activist. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think I do that through many different avenues. And I do consider myself a rebel in that just because it sort of makes me different. Like I have a cohort of 23 people and I teach about the rhetoric of borders and, and boundaries, and I incorporate a lot of this stuff into that. Um, and that's different than anybody else that I've seen. So that sets me apart, I guess. I mean, I'll say my own, you know, my own commitment um, to uh, journalism uh, is rooted in uh, a commitment to uh, to tell people's stories honestly and fairly. You know, the, the idea of objectivity, you know, there is no such thing as objectivity as they teach it in the journalism schools because every one of us goes into a situation with our own particular set of blinders. You know, in my case, it's, uh, you know, uh, male raised in the public school system of the United States of America in the latter part of the 20th century, right? That's the set of blinders I go into a situation with. And the only thing you can do as a journalist, is you can get people's stories and you can be fair and you can be honest. You can never really be completely objective in that sort of magical sense that, um, that they talk about in journalism school. And so what I try to do, um, and uh, perhaps that makes me a rebel from the, uh, from the mainstream, is I try to, uh, to give voice to the unrepresented and underrepresented people and get their stories out. That's fine for me too. I'm, I'm, I'm not very good at labeling myself. A lot of people do that for me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think we might be out of time. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming out. Um, again, we'll be at Rainbow Bookstore also this evening. We'll probably say most of the same things, although we won't have all of your insightful questions. So uh, we'll have to uh, we'll have to answer other questions instead. But um, we do have books available and. Uh, it's also available through online retailers, and it's also available at uh, Rainbow, and uh, Rumble One's Own is getting them, but I don't think they had arrived yet when I was there the other day. So thank you all very much. Thank you all. So you didn't say anything about Dallas Star? No, I didn't. You don't know him? No. Okay. You just Google it. I will.